Nick Liz Tyson is, is, has been director of the Captive Animal Protection Society for the last four years, um, a national organisation based in Topham. Uh, uh, she, uh, the, the, the charity focuses on the exploitation of animals in captivity, particularly circuses and zoos. Um, so, uh, can we have a big hand, please? For Question the elephant swaying backwards and forwards in the zoo in London. 
And so we started to see zoos springing up out of town. So for example, Chester Zoo, this is a photo taken in the 1960s from Chester Zoo. They moved out of town, they said that now we're giving the animals more space. We recognise animals need more than these kind of concrete cages that, that we've got them in. These are still three polar bears in a pit in the north of England, but still, zoos were seeing themselves as kind of progressing away from this, this sort of very small enclosures which didn't suit the animals' needs. At that time, the animals were taken from the wild. I don't, I hope I'm not going to shout anyone's illusions here, but um, back in the 1950s, um, perhaps one of the most famous conservationists, David Attenborough from this country, was had a TV program called ZooQuest, where he literally would go over to various countries as there was ZooQuest to Sierra Leone, ZooQuest to Guyana, and he would capture animals to bring them back to the zoo industry. Um, and this was standard practice, that was where animals came from at that time, and in fact animals such as elephants and long-lived animals um, that are in zoos today were taken from the wild by no babies. Then, the early 60s, things started to change slightly, and part of this was because of things like CITES. So our awareness of the impact that taking animals from the wild, habitat degradation, not just for zoos, but um, was having on the wild, on these species of animals, was becoming more and more talked about, was becoming more and more understood. So in the early 60s, discussion started, which led to this, the CITES Convention, which is the Convention on International Trade in, in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. Um, what that meant for the zoo industry was that they could no longer capture animals sort of queen in from the wild. Um, there were much more strict regulations put on them. And that was when zoos started to talk much more about captive breeding. Not necessarily because they chose to, but because they had to. Interestingly, in terms of messaging, that was, it was quite convenient, really, because when zoos stopped capturing animals from the wild, that really served, in my view, their purpose, because then people capturing animals from the wild were suddenly deep poachers, as it, and zoos weren't doing that. So they spun this sort of practice that had been carried out for years by this industry to their advantage. So captive breeding became the kind of buzzword in conservation. Now, sure, absolutely, 100%, if you compare a zoo now, most zoos now, to the to London Zoo in Victorian times, of course, it's, it's improved. Of course, there's more greenery, of course, the animals have more space, of course, there's environmental enrichment, and there's more platforms, there's, there's more ropes. Ultimately, though, from our, our, from our perspective as an animal rights organisation, regardless of whether that tiger is in an enclosure full of greenery, that tiger doesn't belong in the city. So, zoos began after the CITES Convention, and as we sort of moved along, the animal rights movement began, obviously, sort of in the 1960s, 70s, and started to gain momentum, started questioning zoos and, and their very existence. Was it right to hold animals in captivity? And hands up to them, zoos are incredibly good at PR. And what changed very much was their messaging. Animals were still being kept in captivity, the same species, the same, on the same sites, doing the same things, but the messaging changed. And I'm sure most of you will recognise these four headings on the right hand side as words which are generally attributed to zoos. So what I want to do is go through them all and have a look at them. And I can't obviously, in the short time we've got, I can't go into huge amounts of detail, but hopefully we can have a look at some of these claims and see how they stand up. Starting with perhaps the main buzzword uh, when it comes to zoos, which is conservation. Now this is a quote I wanted to start with, this is by a guy called David Hancock who used to run um, a number of leading zoos actually over in um, Australia. So he says there's a commonly held misconception that zoos are not only saving wild animals from extinction but also reintroducing them to their wild habitats. The confusion stems from many sources, all of them zoo based. In reality, most zoos have had no contact of any kind with any reintroduction programme. And I wanted to use that as a starting point because I think he, he, he taps into two very key points. People think zoos breed animals in order to save them from extinction, and people think that zoos then release those animals into their natural habitat in order to bolster the wild populations. So this is what I want to have a look at. In fact, a 2012 study carried out by the Wall Creek Foundation found that 83% of animal species held in zoos surveyed are not threatened in the wild at all. So, and when the, and the remaining 17% range from um, vulnerable through to critically endangered. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of animals that are actually endangered that are held in zoos. The vast majority of space, the vast number of animals are not threatened in the wild at all. And they are there because people like to look at them. That's why we've got main cats in zoos. That's why we've got other species of animals that we find fun to look at. We think they're cute, we think they're adorable, 
and that's what sort of brings the visitors in. Keeping them there is not serving any conservation purpose though. Captive breeding is considered by some, including me, to be a diversion from the real cause of species decline. Um, breeding animals in captivity that will never be released in the wild creates a really damaging, in my view, really damaging message because what it's saying to zoo visitors is that if some Arctic tigers become extinct because they've been poached or because of habitat degradation, it's okay because we've got two Samarchan tigers who have just had cubs at London Zoo and we're saving the species in that way. But of course, if those animals are never going to see their natural habitat, then have we really saved the species? Or have we just, are we congratulating ourselves for keeping their genetics going and we're using them as genetic vehicles, but not actually serving any conservation purposes? Because if those tigers never ever go back to the wild, then really what would we save at all? The other really big argument that comes from zoos, so when you, when you challenge them on this and you say, well, 83% of your animals aren't threatened to us, so how can you pretend that you're, you're serving conservation? They say, ah, well, the animals that aren't threatened in the wild, they're the ambassadors. So if we didn't have the meerkats, the people wouldn't come. If people didn't come, we wouldn't get the money. And if we didn't get the money, people don't just donate to conservation. They have to come to the zoo so we can get the money, so we can pass the money to the conservation projects, and then they'll save the animals. It all seems like a very tenuous link to me, but interestingly, a couple of years ago, I was, um, we know that zoos don't give a, a huge amount of money to conservation, and that's partly because zoos are pretty expensive to run. When you've got 1,000, 2,000, 8,000 animals, then that is a very, very expensive operation. The likelihood of you being able to make enough money, even if you wanted to, to then make any meaningful impact on conservation projects that so desperately need funding in habitat states, is pretty slim to be honest. But a couple of years ago, I was doing a, um, I was doing a, a television debate on um, one of the news channels, Five News, I think it was, and I was pitched against one of the guys from the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquarium, the are so just less than a mouthful. And in this, he sort of found, there was a new paper, and he sort of proudly, and he really took me down in this debate, and he said, well, zoos give, zoos are the um, third largest contributor to conservation efforts, and this was just after I said zoos don't really contribute to conservation. Well, I can't have an open argument with him on TV. So I went to him afterwards and said, okay, tell me more about this paper that you're talking about. And he said, well, yeah, zoos are the third largest contributor to conservation efforts. And I said, when you say zoos, what do you mean? Because there are thousands of zoos in the world. So zoos combined, uh, he said, well, all of the members of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So that's about 400 businesses. Um, and I said, well, who were the first two then? So they're the third, like, and he said, don't sort of mumble the response. And I said, well, so can you say that again? He said, the WWF and the Nature Conservancy. Two charities give more independently of one another than the entire global zoo community's conservation efforts. Now, I know that there are issues with both of those organisations. I'm not necessarily a supporter either, but it does pay to the argument that people don't give directly to conservation efforts. They do. They do give to conservation charities. So, as I mentioned before, the, the animals that are born in zoos will generally die in zoos. And again, this idea of having this sort of um, reserve population, insurance population, that's what we came now from the zoo industry. These animals are the insurance population, just in case one day they need to be released. But this insurance population is being bred and bred and bred and bred. And the fact that there's nowhere for them to go means that the outcome for many animals, many, many animals, is that they are killed. Um, I think the word euthanasia is often used in relation to this, but it's not euthanasia. Euthanasia is carried out when you are effectively putting an animal out of his or her misery because she's suffering. Euthanasia is not killing healthy animals, and this is what happens in zoos every single year. And those of you that were aware of the killing of Marius the giraffe in Copenhagen Zoo earlier this year sparked an absolute outrage. And the one thing that was good that came out of Marius' death was it really put a spotlight on the zoo industry for this practice. And um, people working on these campaigns knew that zoos killed healthy animals. Um, but we didn't have a, we didn't really know how many. And following the killing of Marius Durat, they were they were pressured and pressured and pressured by both the public and the and the media to tell to tell the public how many animals were dying. And a spokesperson for the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria made a statement um, was at 347 I think it was, healthy animals were killed in ERs and zoos every year, you extrapolate that just to Europe and you're looking at 10,000 healthy animals every single year, deliberately bred and deliberately killed. So again, if that serves conservation then 
I'm really not sure how. So those are some of the arguments that we have against conservation in zoos, um, or against the idea that zoos serve conservation. So let's move on to animal welfare. There's a, there's a campaign on, on zoos in the UK, and, and the UK and Ireland are our main focus. We don't really focus anywhere else. I'm often berated by people who really care about animals, and they say, why are you wasting your time working on zoos in the UK? Because they're the best in the world, and they have the best animal welfare. And if you're really bothered about zoos, then you should be focusing on and their names of other country. Now, I can hand on heart say, the day that we go into a zoo, regardless of our ethical opposition, if we went into UK zoos and we simply weren't finding welfare problems, we wouldn't be focused on them. But every single investigation we've carried out, every single zoo visit we've carried out, we have found animal welfare problems in UK zoos. So I want to start with this video here, which I took on the 15th of October this year at Edinburgh Zoo. Edinburgh Zoo is a member of Association of Zoos and Aquaria. This is one of the many big cat enclosures. This is the Anna Leopard. Um, regardless of any standards, he's got greenery, he's got logs, he's got things to climb on. To be honest, that, that enclosure is probably about the size of my living room uh, because where it goes back, you can see that the rocks at the top is sort of this glass front and it goes back probably 20 metres. This guy has lived there for five years at least, and he's been cased, there's been complaints about him casing in this way for the last five years. In uh, a couple of months ago, the, the zoo said that they were going to redevelop their big cat enclosures because they wanted to just keep in, keep in step with um, modern zoological sort of, um, standards. As, according to them, their standards are fine. According to them, at the minute, the big cats are fine, they just want to improve things. Yeah. And this is the tiger. Um, I went back and visited these guys three times, the tiger twice and the other leopard three times um, over the course of three hours, and that was all they were That's their life. So I think one thing that this shows us, and I'll move on to an elephant at Chester Zoo, another one of sort of jewels in the crown in terms of the zoo industry. This is an elephant called Ty. She was taken for a while when she was a baby. Uh, she's been in zoos for 48 years. Chester Zoo would argue that they didn't cause her to demonstrate this behaviour, which is known as stereotypic behaviour. It's a sign of mental distress. And when it reaches such a level, then it can be a sign of serious psychological damage. And there's been studies carried out which show that there can be actual brain changes of animals who show these type of behaviours. Now, Chester Zoo would argue that they, it wasn't them that captured her, it wasn't, so they're giving her the best possible pet. If an animal is doing this for 48 years, then surely we should be questioning whether these animals should be in captivity at all. Regardless of who started it, it's about who started it, it's about their experience living in captivity, living in zoos. So there are the, there are the kind of obvious um, behavioural problems, and then there's things that perhaps we don't see so much. So looking going from one individual elephant to elephants more generally in zoos, a government funded study found that the majority of elephants show stereotypic behaviours like ties. So the majority of elephants are suffering mentally from being in captivity. 75%, the vast majority of them are overweight, but surely that's something that could be controlled. And then, horrifically, six, only 16% of elephants could walk normally. 84% of elephants in zoos were found to show degrees of lameness. Is this not a sign that these animals should not be in captivity full stop? So, <coughs> to perhaps again, sort of, the welfare problems that we don't always see, the welfare problems that are not obvious, but as soon as you look at this picture, I hope you can all see there's something very wrong. Um, this guy here has had half of his wing amputated. Um, all of the flamingos in this picture will have had half of their wings amputated when they were a couple of days old. It's a process called pinioning. It's a process that my organisation has a campaign against. And it's one of those things that's sort of hidden in plain sight. It happens if you go to a zoo or a wildlife park where there are flamingos or pelicans in open top enclosures. The likelihood is they would have had half of their limb removed to prevent them from flying away. Why do the zoos do it? Because it's cheaper than building aviators that are allowed them to fly. Um, we expect anybody interested in finding more about this practice, we've got a, a whole campaign on it. It's going to Europe. We've, we've changed the practices in a number of zoos in the UK. Um, I've got sort of says, come and talk to me afterwards if you want to find out more about this. And then again, we move from the kind of very obvious ones to the even less obvious welfare problems. 
Welfare isn't just about animal health. This given is a beautiful specimen. He's healthy. His, his fur is lustrous. He looks, he's the right weight, he's the right size. But you know, he's a double and do. He's, um, he's sat on the floor, first of all. Behaviorally, that's not what gibbons are supposed to do. Supposed to do. Gibbons are arboreal. They spend the vast majority of their time in trees. They wouldn't normally come down to the ground. And perhaps most importantly, he's on his own. Mm -hmm. I can't express enough how, well, everyone here should know, we're all primates. Um, keeping a human in solitary confinement, we would all recognise as one of the worst punishments you can inflict on somebody. We recognise imprisoning somebody, taking away their liberty is bad enough, but solitary confinement, I think we can all accept that that is something that nobody would want to happen to us. In the UK, technically, it's not exactly followed through, but to keep a primate, individually without any company of his or her own mind is technically illegal because it's recognised how social primates are as, as a taxa. Um, yeah, this guy's on his own in the middle of Dublin. Is this an animal with his welfare needs met? And this lady's here with her, with her baby. She lives in Edinburgh Zoo. Um, she's a drill. She should live in Cameroon or um, Nigeria. She should live in a, in a big troop and she should that they should all take turns and looking after babies, they should have really complex sort of um, lifelong relationships. She lives in a really small group, there's, there's a male in there, there's, I'm not sure exactly how many are in this group, but she lives in this room. This is her indoor space, it's like a kitchen. It's, it's tile walls, presumably because it's easier to clean. There's, as you can see, there are some ropes and, and things for them to climb on, sawdust on the floor, I think. And outside, the outdoor space is probably not much bigger than this stage slightly higher. And this is where they live. This is where she brings up her baby. This is this is decades they will spend in this room in their outside space at Edinburgh Zoo so people can go to the monkey house and look at them. Is this an animal whose welfare needs to be in there? <coughs> One of the things that I always have thrown at me is but no, we've got the best legal standards in the world. It's not it wouldn't be allowed. It wouldn't be allowed for animals welfare needs to be met. So if the zoo's license therefore the animal's welfare needs must be being met because just wouldn't be allowed. 2011, we carried out a very detailed um, investigation using, I won't bore you with the details, but basically using the documentation which was produced by the government inspector. So it's not our interpretation, it's their own words. 90% of English zoos failed to meet legal standards at some stage during the five year period that we looked at. And 1,003 recognised breaches of law were noted, with more breaches of animal welfare related provisions than any other area of legislation. Can anyone guess how many of those 1,003 breaches were followed up with enforcement action? Zero. Correct. Um, so yeah, and I, my, my doctoral research is on this, is on this subject. I look at um, the enforcement of, of the zoo licensing law, basically. Um, and I can assure you, yeah, the legislation exists, but that being translated into guaranteeing animal welfare is there's a big gap between those two things. And then finally, this, this, this is just something I kind of wanted to tag on the end. It's not just an activity, it's not just being in the wrong climate. And you know, you often hear, I often hear sort of zoo saying things like, um, but you know, the animals have got, it's, it's like a five star hotel for them. You know, they have all their needs met, they're, they're never sick because they have great veterinary care. Um, you know, they, they never have to worry about food, they never have to hunt, they never die from starvation. But, I think one of the things we perhaps forget is the space. Great, give me a weekend in a five-star hotel, but tell me that I can never leave that five-star hotel and I'm not going to set foot in there. Tigers and lions are 18,000 times less space than zoos than they have in the wild. They're, these are wide-ranging predators. Polar bears want a million times less space in zoos than they would have in the wild. So these animals simply don't have the space. And if you imagine, you go and see a, an elephant who might travel up to 50 kilometers a day with her family, you could go there when you're, when you're five years old with your parents. You could go there again when you have kids yourself, and you could then take your grandkids, and that elephant will still be there. Ty, who's been there for 48 years, different zoos, still captivity, and she could live till she was 70. Our, imagine our entire lifetimes lived in that same space. Again, is that meeting animal welfare needs? We would argue that no, it isn't. So animal welfare, perhaps in our view, not all it's cracked up to be in the UK zoos. Moving on to education. So, 
What does Zeus claim about education? This is one of the this is one of the sort of major claims that they make after after conservation. The, the, the kind of animal welfare from the zoo industry perspective is almost that it's a given. You know, of course we look after them. Why are you even questioning that? But education is another one of the active claims that they make. They claim that they educate their visitors and they claim that they inspire new generations of conservationists. Now, this is my view that you go and see an animal in a zoo, so you go and see that animal leopard, or you go and see a tiny elephant in a Chester Zoo, or you go and see a leopard sitting on the floor in Dublin. And what are you going to learn about those animals? You'll see what size they are, what shape they are, you'll see if they look kind of healthy, I'll get an idea of the physiological structure of them, be able to smell them maybe. Um, but what am I going to learn? What do I learn about the animal leopards in Edinburgh Zoo pacing backwards and forwards? Very, very little. And anything I can learn from the animal leopard in Edinburgh Zoo, I could also learn from books, television, the internet. And in fact, I could probably learn a hell of a lot more by watching amazing natural, natural history documentary footage, because then it's showing them in the natural environment doing what they're supposed to do, fitting into their ecosystem, playing, playing their role, playing the role that they're supposed to be playing. Um, so there's a, there's a long-standing argument that animals and zoos are outside of their natural habitat. They're behaving in a way that they wouldn't in the wild. They're usually kept in unnatural social groups. They often show up normal behaviours. Um, so therefore, animals and zoos are just poor representatives from an ed educational perspective of their wild living relatives. But it's not just my opinion. There was the, the role of zoos in education has been questioned for many years. A government-funded study published in 2010 recognise that zoos have education programs, they recognise they have materials, they recognise they have signage, um, but they raise concerns with regard to the lack of available evidence of, of them actually working, the effectiveness of them. And I can, I go to enough zoos as part of my work, and you see people running around, children going around, school groups going around, and it's, it's, a, it's a fun day out for them, but how many people are actually standing and actively engaged in any sort of learning process? Um, not that many, and again, this is not just my opinion, a, a peer-reviewed study published just a few months ago um, confirmed that, and I was actually quite surprised by this, I thought some kids would be learning something, but the majority of children, the majority of children surveyed showed either no change in their learning with regard to um, conservation issues, or even worse, they showed negative change, so they knew less, or they, knew, they, they came up with false information having visited the zoo, and that was over three, I think around 3,000 children visiting London Zoo, it was a long-term study, um, published in a leading peer-reviewed journal. Um, and furthermore, and I, actually, I, I actually find this quite sad, that, that this, this kind of promise from the zoo industry that, you know, it's all worthwhile because we're inspiring future conservationists and they're going to be the ones that save the world. I've got a great deal of faith in young people in conservation. But the study found that children didn't feel empowered at all by their visit to the zoo as to how they could personally help conservation efforts. So, education in zoos, again, that's not, it's all, not all that it's packed up to be. Which brings us to kind of full circle, and I started with a picture of the elephant in London Zoo with everybody riding on his or her back. Um, recreation, the great day out. Now, I've talked a lot about zoo messaging, I've given you my views on, on whether or not that's, that's valid or not. We'll come back to that. Then we have things like this, Zoo Lakes, um, here in London. Uh, there was a huge uproar this year because somebody went there, they were drunk, they threw beer at the tiger, they were going to go and get in the penguin pool and swim with them. And London Zoo insists that this was an educational um, event and that the people that went to Zoo Lakes, according to London Zoo, went away with a much better understanding of conservation issues. I'm not sure if they learned that at the silent disco or at the comedy show or watching squirrel monkeys play football. Um, but when we actually asked London Zoo if they could provide us with the evidence for this claim, they said it was an internal study and they didn't have any, and they didn't have any information. So I wanted to end up on this. Um, I wanted to end up on this um, slide and then leave time for questions. And this, for me, really kind of exemplifies, the, I guess, the visitor experience versus the animal experience in zoos. This, again, I've, I've used a lot of Dublin Zoo because I happened to go to Dublin Zoo this year, but you can find this in, in many, many zoos around the UK and Europe. We've got the orangutans sat here on this patch of grass. They've got their trees, um, their dead trees. There's no foliage, so these are these animals that would make nests. They've got to spend an awful lot of their time foraging. There is no foliage. 
Um, it was freezing this day, it was absolutely freezing. And I just kind of sat, not really doing much, on the floor. And next to them, this immense structure, which I guess probably cost tens of thousands of pounds, is the children's play area. And I stood um, filming the orangutans for a long time. And the vast majority of children, who can blame them, saw this amazing play area, ran straight past the orangutans and went to play. And the very fact that the zoo industry is investing, of course, you know, investing in your young businesses is that great, but the very fact that they're investing such a huge amount of money in the visitor experience, that's why we've got things like Zoo Lakes, that's why this play forest is by far more complex and interesting than the place that the orangutans spend their entire lives. Um, and this, this, this photograph just made me really sad, and it just makes me... This to me exemplifies what zoos are really about. Yeah, they're, they're a great day out, if, if, if that's the kind of thing you like. And I'm sure, you know, I've got a little nephew, he's two years old. He would love to go and see a tiger or an elephant. He would be fascinated. But at what cost? So, to, yeah, children can go and they can enjoy it, and they, they, they may learn something. The evidence suggests they probably won't. But I think we need to be really careful about pretending that just because we enjoy something, we have a right to do it. Um, <laughs> And I think when, if we balance with our afternoon's pleasure and these animals' entire lifetimes and the impact that it has on them, then that's what makes us question the zoo industry from both from an animal welfare, from a conservation, from an education, and from an ethical perspective. So that concludes all I wanted to say about zoos today. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any comments from people. Thank you.